I am Maria Junggren. I am an associate professor, docent in sustainable materials management at Environmental Systems Analysis, uh, Chalmers. Uh, I am also involved in the production area of Advance uh, since a few years, and uh, I have a PhD from Chalmers in um, pro from uh, energy technology, the, the systems group in there. But then, and after that, I left Chalmers for a, a number of years and came back to environmental systems analysis in uh, 2011. And from 2015, I'm full time uh, at um, uh, this division, which is now at technology management and economics. So uh, yeah, now, nowadays I describe my area, my research area as circular economy, and I'm involved in research and education. So I will talk about both today. So uh, since this is a quite broad group, I want to start by trying to answer um, the million dollar question, what is the circular economy? Because that's the question that you usually get when you say that you work with the circular economy. What is it really? Um, then I will also um, come into uh, uh, the education that I do in, in circular economy. It's a course um, um, that has uh, now been given twice uh, in the second cycle. So I will uh, talk about that a little bit and then give you some examples of the research uh, on circular economy that I do together with colleagues uh, at my division and in, uh, with other um, researchers that we collaborate with. So I will give you some uh, snapshots from a larger research program funded by Mistra, Mistra Ries, which is basically a circular economy program for the Swedish manufacturing industry. And then I will also talk uh, more about um, research theme that I uh, spend quite a lot of time on myself, which uh, is uh, methods in a more circular economy. So then what is the circular economy? Uh, there are so many different uh, answers to this question. So we talk about a linear economy and then the circular economy is then the opposite, uh, recycling, uh, circularity, spaceship economy, waste as food, designing out waste, it is the butterfly diagram, it is the six R's, uh, it is the decoupling economy, it's about circular business models, yeah, it's the same as resource efficiency, sustainable consumption and production, uh, sustainability is just new terminology. So uh, there are many ideas of how to answer this question. And when, uh, yeah, I've been struggling with this uh, quite a lot, but uh, then ended up with accepting that there is no precise answer to it and that we probably can live uh, without it and do um, interesting research and education and development in society without agreeing on a specific definition. So there is, for example, one paper that has reviewed uh, 114 definitions of the circular economy that was done in 2017. So I'm sure that there are even more definitions by now. Uh, but what they found in this paper was that uh, they, the definitions often have in common that uh, the, they um, see that the aim of the circular economy is um, um, sustainable development. There are some core principles that are often in common. Uh, so the four R frameworks is the most common one uh, where you distinguish between reducing, reusing, recycling and recovering material resources. Uh, then there are more uh, frameworks um, ranging from three R's up to even 10 R's. Uh, so, but this is the most common one. Uh, also in common is the systems perspective that you need to look over uh, the life cycles uh, of how uh, the material resources are being used and you also need to consider the number of actors that are involved uh, and all the different activities so you cannot just look at smaller entities to capture the, the whole essence of the circular economy. 
There are some enablers for um, implementing the circular economy that are being pointed out, uh, business models and uh, the role of consumers. And uh, there are many different um, illustrations of the circular economy. So here we see uh, just a selection of three. Uh, at the top, we have the Ellen MacArthur butterfly diagram. Uh, distinguishing between the uh, biological cycle uh, on the left-hand side and the technical cycle on the right-hand side. Then we have another um, uh, illustration uh, at the lower left uh, by Bokken and others, where they talk about closing, slowing, and narrowing resource flows. And then there is an illustration um, provided by the European Commission a number of years ago, where um, the circular economy is, is depicted as uh, clearly a loop. Uh, so how to deal with this? Uh, well, uh, Blomsma and Brennan, they uh, have mapped the um, development and um, suggest that you should see the circular economy as an umbrella term. And I, I think that's kind of a relief that we do not have to agree on a specific definition. Uh, that at the same time means that we need to be clear on what more precisely we are uh, discussing when we say that we are working with the circular economy. So uh, to understand a little bit more about what is in it, uh, I also want to show you these um, um, historical descriptions of how the CE has uh, developed uh, over time. And here it has been suggested that there are uh, three distinct time periods. So uh, from the 1970s to the 1990s, it was quite a lot about dealing with waste that was uh, in focus. Uh, later on, it was more about eco-efficiency and connecting input and output. So do more with less. Uh, whereas now uh, it is more about uh, understanding that there is value that can be retained uh, and that we need to maximize that. So if we look at the lower right on the uh, illustration there, we have a, a value hill where we, when we produce a product, we gradually increase the value and then we can retain it if we keep ourselves uh, high up on the value hill. So by reusing, by refurbishing, remanufacturing, and then at the lower end, we have recycling, where we only uh, retain the value of the materials. Uh, and also, um, oh, something happens. Yeah. Um, so also we can see this over time that we are yeah, first a preamble period, then an excitement period when people uh, start to work and use this uh, term. Uh, and now we are in a phase where its validity is being challenged and we don't know exactly what will happen if there will be a coherence or if it will collapse into something else. Uh, so while we do, while we are in this phase, we still know that there is intense activity in policy and business and, and yeah. That is something that we need to, uh, to, to just remember uh, while shaping uh, the subject and knowing that there are many strands and unresolved issues. Uh, but then why a more circular economy? Um, if we look at what the EU and its member states uh, say, um, it's primarily about the economic interests, uh, about the competitiveness, competitiveness of the EU and, and uh, the countries. It's about jo jobs and growth and uh, very much about security of raw materials uh, and reducing the import dependency. Uh, secondly, uh, and there's a distinct difference here that it's just the second uh, priority, um, the environmental concerns. So, um, and more recently, it has been um, more acknowledged that the circular economy is a prerequisite for the climate, uh, for mitigating climate change. Uh, but I think it's important to remember that the primary interest is economic. Then if we look at, at the companies, because they are part of this economic interest, what are the drivers there? 
uh, more specifically, it's about capturing value. So to save uh, costs on material and energy and to find new business opportunities to move from ownership to access. Uh, so you sell to the customer, not the ownership of a product, but the access. Uh, finding uh, opportunities in providing reuse, um, remanufacturing, uh, collaborating in the supply chain. Uh, when you uh, sell access to a, a product, you uh, increase your interaction and loyalty with the customers. So that is also a clear um, way of uh, capturing value and developing your business. But it's also about managing risks, so um, developing uh, supply chains that are less vulnerable to, for example, price volatility and reputational risks. Um, but then there is, of course, also the more uh, environmental side where we uh, look at natural resources. So this is more my field than of, of research. So we can see over time that resource extraction increases. Um, and uh, we know that most resources are used just once, so we only have 8.6% uh, that goes back into use of all um, the resources that are consumed uh, over a year. This is a global um, number. Uh, and then we also know that we have an increasing diversity of materials that are being used in our products. And um, there's a lot of focus on uh, different green um, energy technologies or other green technologies uh, that require all these uh, specific metals. Uh, and this is, of course, one um, uh, way of, or one type of application for these metals. But they are also, of course, used in many of our daily products, like all the electronics, um, uh, which we are increasingly using in, in uh, different applications, the more we turn to uh, Internet of Things and, and so on. Um, and also that we have imports of many raw materials to the EU, so we are highly dependent on other countries, uh, which might not always be stable, and which have their own priorities and de are developing their own economies and might not be uh, always uh, interested in uh, exporting to the EU. Uh, and the resources are interesting in themselves, and you can uh, spend a lot of time on, on trying to understand uh, what are being used where and, and to try to predict and make scenarios for how much will be used in the future. Um, but you uh, all also need to consider that the associated environmental impacts of all uh, these resources that are being extracted uh, refined and then used and disposed of. So if we look at climate change, uh, we see that uh, we can link uh, more than 50% of the global um, climate change impacts to natural resource use. Uh, and climate change uh, is one of the environmental impacts that we need to uh, consider, but there are also uh, many more. And those we could also link in, in different ways to uh, the uh, resource use. So uh, what are then the solutions that are being discussed in the circular economy? Yeah, so returning then to the Ellen MacArthur Foundation butterfly diagram, uh, we see different solutions that prolong the life of products, components and materials. Uh, so for example, yeah, we have uh, maintenance so that we can keep a, uh, a product in use for a longer time period, uh, we can reuse it and then we can um, change it a little bit by repairing it or refurbishing it, remanufacturing it, and then we can recycle it. If it's more um, biologically, um, a bi biological uh, material, then there are other means of uh, handling it. So uh, using uh, different biological treatment methods to extract uh, biochemicals, to digest it anaerobically, to have biogas and, and so on. Uh, but um, considering the full life cycle of these materials and how they are being used. So uh, when developing the course, uh, 
which is called Circular Economy. It's a second cycle course. Uh, we wanted to uh, have a broad overview with a system perspective and addressing both the natural resources, the technology and the actors. So uh, here you can see uh, on the left hand side that we have uh, three uh, different themes, uh, natural resources and actors. So we have uh, industrial ecology as, as one module, uh, supply chain management, user perspective and public policy. Uh, then we also look at more engineering uh, aspects of the circular economy in product design and development, waste management and production engineering and uh, also trying to um, let the students synthesize and apply what we are learning uh, or teaching them. Uh, so having uh, projects that are multidisciplinary because we have students from uh, five, at least five different uh, master programs. And um, we use mixed groups uh, when they do the projects. And we also invite uh, guest lecturers uh, who talk about their um, activities in the circular economy, like ABB and IKEA. And in order to do this, we have also a number of teachers uh, that are involved. So it's uh, uh, I'm the main lecturer and I do a number of these uh, modules, but we also have uh, Arne Haldorsen, Melanie Dispes, Oskar Riksfeldt, Lars Almefeldt, all from uh, Chalmers uh, and also Erik Sundin from uh, Linköping uh, University. Um, so, and we have around uh, 50, 40 to 50 students from uh, different master programs, for example, industrial ecology, uh, production engineering and industrial design engineering. So uh, now I want to continue uh, with uh, some of the research um, that we do uh, on the circular economy. And the first one that I will present is the Mistra RIS program. Uh, RIS stands for Resource Efficient and Effective Solutions. So it is um, directed towards the Swedish manufacturing industry. And uh, we have done uh, one first phase uh, four years, um, and then we have a new phase, uh, which started last year. And uh, um, for both these phases, we have more than 90 million Swedish crowns of direct funding. And then there is also um, co-funding from all these companies. So it's uh, quite a large program um, with many um, researchers involved and many companies involved. So in both phases, uh, Lin Schöping coordinates uh, the program and Lund and Chalmers is involved. Um, from uh, uh, Chalmers, Anne-Marie Tillman uh, led the work in the first phase and now in the second phase, I uh, lead uh, our work. So in the second phase, you can see here which um, uh, companies we are collaborating with. Uh, Volvo, uh, ABB, um, Husqvarna, um, Athens, Alimac, Polyplank, Peltarion, uh, Bright Echo, Teknikföretagen is also in, and a small company called Off to Off. Um, so, um, yeah, considering the situation with the Corona, and so we are uh, doing most of our conversations with the company so far uh, online. Uh, but we are um, in the middle of uh, starting out, up with new uh, case studies where we will uh, work closely with the companies and try to co-create knowledge with them. So what we do uh, is that we have three different research projects within the program. So it's one about designing support um, or design support rather. Um, so it's about product design and service design and also understanding how uh, the business models can be uh, developed. Uh, and that is Lin Schöping and Lund, who is mostly involved in that. Then we also have uh, public policies for um, RIS, uh, where uh, researchers at Lund explores the interactions at the policy level with 
between uh, these resource efficient solutions and the policy and how yeah, they interact. And then we have one third uh, project, which is more about assessing all the solutions that are being developed together with the companies. And uh, I'm managing that project uh, and it uh, involves both environmental and financial impacts. Um, and our role in this is to uh, clarify short and long-term environmental and resource use impacts of shifting to more circular solutions so that we can explore opportunities, but also limitations of the circular economy. And here we want to assist the companies in finding solutions that can contribute to reducing or uh, minimizing uh, the environmental impact. And what we do uh, is case studies uh, and then later on synthesis uh, of the case studies. And we use typically life cycle assessments, dynamic material flow analysis, criticality assessments and indicators in order to understand uh, yeah, the, the benefits and the drawbacks of these solutions. Um, and a third theme, no, uh, no, not the third theme, but another theme that I want to talk about is uh, the research that uh, I'm particularly involved in. So uh, I have uh, since a number of years a focus on metals uh, and what happens to metals when we try to move to a more circular economy. And um, it's a broad topic and um, metals are one of the cons main concerns when it comes to uh, the uh, import dependency of the EU. And also, as I said in the beginning, we are using a diversity of materials and metals in complex combinations in our products today. So one of the things that we need to do first is to map uh, what are we in fact using uh, and what happens, uh, what are the fates of these metals over the life cycle? What happens when we try to recycle, reuse, repair and design for longevity? What does that improve or how, in what way does it change uh, the way we are um, using the metals? So here we do studies on the European level. Um, I will show a result in a minute, uh, we, but we also look at product levels. Uh, I have worked a lot with vehicles and electronic and electrical equipment. Uh, and it's mostly uh, this type of uh, mapping is mostly done using material flow analysis. Uh, but then uh, we also need to think about, okay, we have all these uh, metals. Uh, how do we prioritize them? Uh, which ones are more important? Which ones are more related to different risks? And then we need to have methods so that we can assess the scarcity of these metals. Um, we see that there are different challenges in the long term and in the short term. So in the long term, it's more about depleting the ones that are uh, more rare in the crust. Uh, and in the short term, it's more about uh, having access to the ones that uh, are um, are linked to supply risks uh, and also that are economically important. And that is what we call crit uh, criticality. So we need to, to remember that there are different um, challenges related to different uh, methods. And, in, and that is something where we need to have, well, yeah, work on the methods. Um, and then uh, we also do innovation system studies on recycling, where we try to see um, what does uh, the technology, the actors, the business models, the policy, what does that mean in terms of uh, recycling opportunities and how can it differ between uh, different uh, types of, of products like vehicles and Tripoli. So uh, now I will show you a few results uh, from uh, the research on metals. So first one mapping of scarce and critical metals. So this is the annual turnover of selected metals in passenger cars in the EU. So we can see on the left hand side that we have metals that are being placed on the market uh, in new cars. And then we have a large stock of metals in the fleet. 
And then at the right hand side, we have cars leaving the fleet. A small share is exported from the EU. Uh, and um, yeah, a little bit more than half is registered as recycled. Uh, but then we also have a big gap where we don't know where the uh, vehicles end up. It could be that they are exported illegally, but it could also be that uh, they remain somewhere, uh, but they are not registered. Um, and there is also a significant uh, uh, effect of trying to combine different information sources. So. Yeah, it can be a real gap. It is a real gap, but there is also um, the fact that we do not have uh, consistent data for um, doing these uh, maps. Uh, also showing that even if we have, uh, well, vehicles are one of, of the product groups that we have really good um, knowledge about because we have all the vehicle registers. Uh, we still uh, don't have a lot of information if we want to, well, we are lacking information if we want to um, uh, take better care of uh, the resources that uh, are contained in the, in the um, vehicles. So here you see examples of different uh, uh, methods that are being used uh, in uh, vehicles. So ranging from uh, a big share of iron, uh, the dark red uh, field, aluminium and copper, to very small shares of uh, rare and scarce and precious metals like platinum and palladium, neodymium and so on. And, and then if we uh, look at uh, what happens at end of life, uh, the share that is being registered as recycled, what uh, what happens to these uh, metals? Uh, yeah, we have done several studies on recycling of metals in vehicles and, and try to see um, how many of these uh, metals are being functionally recycled. And that means that they are recycled so that they are uh, being used um, for their own uh, purpose or with the, the uh, reusing or again using. Uh, the characteristics uh, of, of these metals. And there we see that we only have platinum, iron, aluminium and copper, which we know is the main share is being recycled. So iron, aluminium and copper, that's uh, quite obvious because that's how the uh, recycling of vehicles is being, has been designed. Uh, these are the big shares. This is where the companies um, make uh, the most profit. And then we have platinum. Uh, and the reason why that is functionally cycled it, it is because it's in the catalytic converter that can be easily removed. And there is an infrastructure in place for that. But for uh, many of the other uh, metals, we see that they are, could be, parts of it could be recycled, functionally recycled. But uh, many of them, uh, the ones that we are concerned with, uh, for the future are lost from functional use because they are dispersed in recycled materials or they end up in uh, residues that are sent to landfill. So even if we have high targets, uh, recycling targets for um, vehicles, we still uh, do not capture uh, many of these um, scarce and critical metals that are being used in small quantities in the vehicles. And if we look then uh, over time, we can also see that um, 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 the metals uh, quantities change. So here we have gold and neodymium. Um, and uh, yeah, historic and projected. So gold we have had in vehicles for quite some time and um, it is not projected to increase that much, um, but it's a still a significant quantity. And neodymium, which, and it is mostly linked then to electronics. Uh, and neodymium is uh, in, mostly in permanent magnets, which can be found in electric uh, uh, motors 
that are in vehicles already today. We are expecting a large increase, uh, which you can see in the projected phase here with all the red and, and uh, um, yellow um, um, types of vehicles. And that these are the electric uh, electrified vehicles. But they are also in the, all the smaller motors. Uh, in the car, like the, the, the um, uh, seat adjusting uh, motor or the, uh, um, yeah, uh, many different types of motors. And uh, if we look at the gold um, and think about how, what can we do in order to recover them uh, when they reach recycling, uh, gold is difficult because it's sort of hidden. It's not well known that there is so much gold in vehicles and it's also dispersed into many different uh, components. Um, so uh, retrieving all these, dismantling all these would be a, a require uh, a lot of manual work. Uh, at the same time, the quantities are comparable to what we could find in uh, electronic scrap, uh, which is now a, to a large extent being recycled because of the gold. So we know that there is infrastructure for uh, recovering gold, uh, but uh, from vehicles, it can only be recycled if components are dismantled before reaching uh, the uh, um, shredding of vehicles. Uh, for neodymium, it's also a hidden flow, uh, at least for all the small motors. Uh, it's also dispersed in many of these small motors. Um, so far, it's much larger than the new car applications that are in focus. So the electric motors uh, that we rely on for electrifying uh, vehicle drivetrains. Uh, here, uh, again, the um, uh, quantities are comparable to we, but uh, even if we would uh, try to dismantle this, uh, the um, recycling opportunities are very limited. So, um, Yes, I will just, this is my, I think I will skip this one um, and end uh, with some conclusions. So uh, the circular economy uh, is, as we see it, not an end in itself. Uh, there are benefits in terms of uh, economics, environmental concerns. Um, we know that there are opportunities um, yeah, and benefits, um, but there are also clear limitations and we need to um, consider that when we uh, implement new solutions. And what we have seen in our studies so far on the environmental impacts is that we need to understand much more about these impacts. Uh, we cannot just rely on simplified guidelines uh, like um, the waste hierarchy and, and these other R frameworks, they can be good as initial uh, ID for uh, initial ID uh, ideation, uh, but they are not sufficient for designing solutions. You cannot uh, use them for finding the trade-offs and the shifts between different types of environmental impacts and, and so on. It is a subject being shaped uh, and uh, it is at the same time, an intense activity in policy and business, uh, but it's also an early phase. So um, it's interesting to be in this area uh, because uh, um, academically, uh, it's a subject that is being uh, developed, but at the same time, it's very much influenced by uh, the intense activity in policy and business. And sometimes we need to distinguish between uh, what is more the academic side of it and what is the policy and business side of it. Uh, and uh, for future research and education, I think it's important that uh, we try to build knowledge through multi and transdisciplinary collaboration because this is such a broad topic. Um, and I see um, that that is a clear benefit of being in Mr. Rees, but also in fact, being in uh, the course circular economy where we can uh, where I can collaborate with other teachers at Chalmers. Um, and uh, we also see that um, there is a lot of uh, promise in the circular economy, 
but at the same time it's so early that we do not um, yet have much empirical, empirical knowledge about what are the real benefits and the drawbacks in uh, in for the companies and the solutions that have been implemented and that in fact exist so um, that is something that I would really like to see uh, in the future. So yeah, this was my presentation um, and thank you for listening. <laughs>